Now, the obvious prompt for this session is the midterms coming up on November the 8th. America's first chance to put their thumbs up or thumbs down on the Biden administration. And <coughs> you might remember when, around the time that Biden was elected, he was kind of seen as a possibly mollifying figure. Maybe he was going to calm things down uh, after the outrageous and brash uh, Donald Trump. I think it's fair to say things haven't quite worked out like that. Um, so that's what we're going to be discussing uh, for the next hour and a half or so. We've got a fantastic panel here for you today. Um, I'm going to introduce them in the order that they're going to speak. So to your left, we've got Jack Garland from the University of California, Los Angeles. Then we've got Yaron Brook, chair of the Ayn Rand Institute. Then we have Richard Johnson, who is a lecturer in US politics at Queen Mary University. And finally, <coughs> Helen Sells, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Feature Story News. Um, that's enough from me. I'm going to be for about five minutes each. And then we might hear from you and what you think is going on. OK, Jack, do you want to get this off? All right. All right, so we're talking about midterms and the culture wars in the US. And if the United States can maintain its role as a preeminent power, as a world leader, despite the culture wars and despite the polarization happening. Um, so Americans care about domestic issues. It's really hard to get American voters to care about foreign affairs. And so the number one issue on everyone's mind right now is inflation. And that spans Democrats, Republicans, and Independents. It's more, more prominent among Republicans as their main issue compared to Democrats. Um, but everyone's top issue right now is inflation. And then, like every midterm, this midterm election will be a referendum on the president, Joe Biden. And so apart from inflation and a referendum on Biden, we now move to the more social, cultural issues. But there's a very important distinction between cultural issues and cultural war issues. So cultural war issues are issues where policies aren't proposed, ideas aren't proposed, just grievances listed. It's not trying to convince people of an idea or of a policy. It's just trying to rile up their base and enrage the other side. And so the number one culture, cultural issue right now is abortion. And there's some legitimate debates around abortion with real policy implications. And a lot of room in the middle, a lot more than it may seem, to make some compromises. But the Democrats and the Republicans are both exploring this issue to make it a cultural war. And so on the left, we have Joe Biden tweeting recently that a vote for Democrats is a vote to make Roe v. Wade law, which is not that simple. With that statement, he's trying to get Democrats excited and get them to the polls. And on the right, we have Lindsey Graham proposing a bill that bans, that bans abortion nationwide, which breaks from the Republican ranks and goes against the Republican idea that abortion should be a state's issue. His proposed bill, he knows, will never pass, at least not in the next few years. And it's just meant to get Republicans excited, pro-life Republicans especially, and once again, get, to, get them to the polls. And then uh, Democrats and Republicans both have their kind of pet projects, their pet cultural war issues that they push, uh, once again, to get their voters out to the polls. So the Republicans uh, in the last few weeks have ramped up attacks on Democrats for being soft on crime and for allowing crime to happen and run rampant throughout cities. They're not really proposing any policies except for the very general funding of the police. And, um, and then on the right, or on the left, um, they're very concerned about the January 6th committee right now and what uh, issues or what recommendations they might bring forward in the coming weeks. And they are not trying to reach Republicans or reach independents by talking about January 6th and talking about Donald Trump. They're just trying to get another attempt to bash Trump and to get their base excited. So. Moving on to um, America's role as a world leader, um, Trump recently proposed a peace deal or peace talks between Ukraine and Russia, and he actually suggested that he could moderate these peace talks. Um, so that breaks obviously with American policy and with Ukrainian policy. And I think it's safe to suggest that he and his candidates that he's supporting in the midterms um, are less supportive of Ukraine and their fight against Russia. Um, at the same time, Senate Minority Leader Republican Mitch McConnell is one of Ukraine's most ardent supporters. So it's hard to say that more Republicans in Congress would result in less support for Ukraine. I think in the short term, even if some Trump Republicans win their elections, support for Ukraine will be steady from America. Um, 
And Biden right now is Biden and Democrats. Uh, there's a bit of a shift from past years. Uh, they are coming out more supportive of Ukraine. But like I said earlier, I don't think this election will change uh, how much support uh, Ukraine has gotten from the U.S. So to answer the main question of this session, can the U.S. lead amidst all this polarization? Um, it did. It's done before. It's done this last year. It did it with a bill promoting semiconductors and chip manufacturing in the U.S. as opposed to in China. And it did it when Congress rallied around Democrat Speaker Pelosi when she visited Taiwan. And then most importantly, it's done it three times in three separate bills since March, uh, providing support humanitarianly and militarily to Ukraine uh, to the amount of about $65 billion. So no matter the result of the election, the U.S. will continue to be a world leader because politicians understand the responsibility the U.S. has. In the long term, however, there's a possibility America retreats from the world stage. But this won't be because culture wars have destroyed us from within, causing our GDP and our military might to decline. Americans on the right and on the left in 2022 don't care as much as they did during the Cold War or even in the last 20 years about America being the world's lone superpower. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it, it, it's hard for me to see that. I think America is going through a real crisis, a crisis of identity, a crisis of trying to figure out what it is, what it stands for, what it actually represents. For a very long time, uh, the, the ideas uh, at the founding of America, the ideas that made America what it is, I think the greatest country in human history, I know that might not be popular in this audience, uh, the freest country by many uh, by many many measures, and certainly the most powerful economically and militarily in human history. The ideas that made that America possible have been in decline now for decades. One could argue even a century, and that decline has reached a a, a real pivot point. It, it is now a, a, a reality that nobody in the political spectrum of the United States represents what were the ideals that made America great to the extent that America was, I mean, it's kind of funny that Donald Trump uh, had this term of making America great again when Donald Trump has no concept of what America is or what actually made America great to begin with, and that's part of why he failed so miserably. There is no, uh, there's no political voice today for, if you will, the founding fathers of America. There's no, uh, there's no voice today for the concept of individual rights, for the concept of freedom, for the concept of liberty in the United States. There was a struggle and a battle between a left and a right on who will control our lives and in what way that control will manifest itself. One of the striking things about this midterm election is that while the economy will dominate, yes, I, I agree, that if this is going to be determined, that the Republicans will probably win, certainly in the House, possibly even in the Senate, primarily because the economy is doing so badly uh, under, under Joe Biden. The, the, the absurdity of that is that nothing would have been different if Republicans were running things right now. Indeed, many of the inflationary pressures that exist today uh, were caused by Donald Trump's policy of writing uh, massive checks to everybody, bailing everybody out during COVID, and generally increasing government spending throughout all four years of his administration. Indeed, Donald Trump argued for an infrastructure bill far, far greater than anything Joe Biden actually passed. Indeed, one of the things that, it, that is, is, is true globally too, and, and true, you see, you're living in it right now in the UK, that there is a complete consensus about economics between left and right. Uh, you know, a, a trust tries to cut taxes a little bit, tries maybe to bring in a little bit market, uh, of markets into uh, into the UK, uh, uh, you know, political establishment, and she gets crushed for even proposing such a preposterous idea of maybe cutting the top marginal tax rate of 45 percent, which makes imminent sense as you go into a recession to cut the top marginal tax rate if you care about economic growth ultimately. But she can't defend it because the consensus among the people, the consensus among the intellectuals, the consensus among everybody is we need big government involvement in the economy. And that is true in the UK, and that is true in the United States, and that is true in Europe. There's complete consensus about economic issues. We're all way to the left of center on economics. Everybody is. Even Elizabeth, even Trust now, Liz Trust has been brought to her knees 
Now she is going to be left of center on economic issues. So what's the difference between the Republicans and Democrats? What is the battle about? The battle is about cultural issues. That's how left and right are defining themselves. And to a large degree, that is true of the United Kingdom as well. Uh, here, the big difference between the left and right, to a large extent, is around these cultural issues. Uh, the, the popularity of Boris Johnson uh, in the last election was not due to his revolutionary economic plans. It was due to his nationalism and his conservative cultural views, while shifting left on everything economic. Uh, and we're seeing that in the United States, exactly the same phenomena. We're seeing the cultural issues as defining the two political parties. The cultural war is defining the war between the two political parties. Economics, in a sense, is irrelevant. Economic outcome might be relevant, that is the, the you know, swing based on how the economy is doing. But economic policy of the Biden administration and the Trump administration is almost identical. There is almost no differentiation, and I would venture that whether you vote for Labour, whether you vote Conservative, um, in the short run at least, there's going to be very little difference in terms of economic policy. Thank you. Okay. I want to use my time to reflect on the first two years of the Biden presidency. A week before the US presidential election 2020, Joe Biden visited a speaking town in Georgia called Warm Springs. Warm Springs has a population of about 500. It's closer to Alabama than it is to Atlanta. And in a tight presidential election, visiting such a place that is not particularly vote rich is an unusual move. But Biden was going there because of the symbolic significance of Warm Springs, because in the 1920s, 1940s, the most famous president of Warm Springs was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Joe Biden is the only US president to have been born during Roosevelt's presidency, 12 year presidency. It's interesting he's the only one to have been born during it. And for Biden, Roosevelt is something of a political hero. Biden decided to put the portrait of Roosevelt in the Oval Office where Obama had once put Abraham Lincoln, Donald Trump had once put uh, Andrew Jackson. Biden wanted to draw the comparison in two respects. One was the scale of the challenge that he was facing, uh, drawing the comparison with the Great Depression and the COVID pandemic and the economic crisis the United States was facing as a result, uh, and also the scale of ambition. Now, in both respects, Biden was being somewhat hyperbolic, but to campaign in poetry, and perhaps he was taking a bit of poetic license there. I think to take honest assessment of the Biden presidency is to say that Biden has had a consequential uh, and a reasonably legislatively successful first two years. This is in some ways partly down to Georgia, which helped give him the presidency and also gave him control of the Senate. But Biden also has key challenges, challenges that Roosevelt himself might recognize. He faces a divided party, so did Roosevelt. Roosevelt's New Deal was not the, the program that Roosevelt himself might have wanted. It was a compromise he had to reach with the Southern Democratic faction of this party. Sometimes the New, New Deal is described as a compromise between Sweden and South Africa. Biden himself has a divided party between the sort of left justice Democrats, Black Lives Matter wing of the party, the more moderate uh, Blue Dog wing of the party. Um, and also Biden, and again, this is something that uh, Roosevelt might recognize, faces uh, an intransigent Supreme Court. And a court that does threaten to constrain elements of his agenda, and certainly to um, put certain questions back into politics, maybe, that had been taken off, uh, taken off the agenda. That being said, I think there's some interesting continuities also to think about between Biden and Trump. Uh, I think that Biden has, in foreign policy terms, uh, 
there's been greater continuity and change. I think that, in particularly when it comes to China, I mean, Biden is uh, a China hawk. He may not express his words in the same way as Trump in terms of the substance of the US policy towards China, not that much has changed. On trade, Biden emphasizes the Made in America agenda. On the border, Biden has not really reversed a great deal of uh, Trump's um, uh, restrictions at the border. I think this means that Biden is, in some ways, a, uh, a unique figure within the Democratic Party, someone who has the capability to pull this off in a highly divided party. Uh, I, in spite of the a severe weakness, of course, is his age and concerns about that. But in many ways, I think the bigger risk would be to try and replace him with someone else for the next election, given it's not clear that anyone else of the next generation can really hold the Democratic Party uh, together. I think that uh, Donald Trump is likely to be the Republican nominee. I think he will be an effective campaigner, and, and Biden really is in the right time. But I think that Biden has been able to thread the needle on some of these real uh, difficult issues the Democratic Party itself is, is, is battling itself with. Uh, in, in important ways. The final point I'll say is, of course, that the, um, the elephant in the room uh, is the Supreme Court. Uh, and in some ways, liberals are reaping what they sow, sowed by an over-reliance on the court um, and the weak political foundations for some of the objectives that they wanted, relying on a court that could be a fickle mistress. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so I work in uh, the news business, and when we started thinking about the coverage of the midterm elections uh, back in the spring, it all looked fairly predictable. Um, usually, midterm elections are a referendum. Oh, sorry. Usually, uh, the referendums are just uh, kind of the, the uh, midterm elections are a referendum on government. Uh, the economy was doing badly, um, and it just looked fairly predictably as though. Um, it, it would be a, 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 a Republican sweep that they would take the House, they would take the uh, Senate, um, there would be a real dissatisfaction with gas prices at $5 a gallon, which I know is not very high for Britain, but that's astronomical for us. Um, uh, so, um, you know, that, that was kind of what you thought was going to happen. But I think the interesting thing is that whereas that is on everybody's mind, Inflation hasn't actually become the issue that people think it, it, it is in the election because, as you said, quite rightly say, there is no debate about how to deal with inflation. I mean, it's just kind of this act of God and people are pissed off and so they're anti government, but it doesn't really uh, work itself out of policy. Um, and the only policy that seems to be, uh, uh, you know, effective at the moment is to export our inflation by having a strong dollar. I mean, that's kind of almost the, the only thing that's happening. But when you looked at what the issues were in the spring, it was very much the culture issues of um, uh, school choice. You know, we, were, we planned a whole kind of series of packages, uh, news packages that we were going to do on school boards and school elections and school choice because it, it seemed as though, you know, the culture war was uh, unfolding and school choice was going to be a very important issue um, in, in, in this upcoming election and it would be the stick that Republicans could use to beat um, the kind of woke Democrats uh, very effectively. But what's kind of thrown a spanner in the works in this, in this particular climate is actually abortion. The abortion issue, I think, has changed the culture wars in quite an interesting way. Um, abortion traditionally in America is, was used as a stick for the right to, for the Republicans to get their vote out. It was something that was always a way to rally the troops, to get, you know, get to the party favor and to get the vote out. And so it was seen as an issue that would favor um, uh, Republicans. With the Dobbs decision and the um, uh, decision to throw out Roe v. Wade, and then the subsequent election in Kansas, I think that issue has changed dramatically. But What's happened is that you, and, and it took everybody by surprise. Um, the, you know, the right 
felt that they had an issue that they could really win on, and this was, you know, it makes fantastic, and they had a majority on the court. This was like their wet dream, if you like, of what was going to happen. Um, but it's really kind of backfired, and I think now there is a genuine debate about abortion, um, which even the left are really not in a position to uh, take charge of. Because if you look at the sort of pro-choice organizations in America, they kind of put abortion very much on a back burner. They thought it was either a separate issue or that they had to talk about uh, abortion in a much more kind of uh, woke way of talking about pregnant people and chest feeding and all this kind of stuff was what was dominated at the left side. So now you actually have ordinary people who would like access to abortion now saying that this is one of the key issues in the election. And I think it will not necessarily mean that the Republicans will um, uh, uh, you know, not win the House, I think the Republicans will win the House, but I'm not entirely sure they'll win it by the thumping majority that they thought they were going to win it by. And I think that if you look at the Senate, um, uh, it's also going to be a, quite a challenge, I think, for the Republicans to win the Senate. I mean, they, they ought to. They ought to win it, given what's going on in the world and given the kind of um, popular kind of uh, policies that they could put forward um, uh, at, the, at the beginning. But I think abortion has thrown a span in the works for them because ordinary women need abortions. And so young women, suburban uh, mums, that kind of key voting uh, uh, element of the public have got kind of caught up in a, in, a, in a cultural issue which previously worked in a different way and now suddenly is um, getting people to come out and vote. Um, and we have to see how effective it is, but I do think it has changed the um, uh, landscape. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay, so now it's your turn to get make your points, get out your questions. Have we got some mics going around? Uh, yeah, can we get a mic to this guy there? And if there's another one, can we get it over here? No, oh, okay. Um, right. Up there. Has anyone got a question upstairs? Yes. Hi. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Calvin. I'm based in Bullets. Sorry, could you stand up, please? Stand up. Oh, I'll hit my head if I stand up. I'll leave last go again. All right. Hello. My name is Calvin. Um, around the, the America, state of America right now, it seems to me that there are two sides, right? There's been sort of called the Trumpy side and the sort of wokey side. But it seems that both sides look at the other and say the other is pathology, and they're the cure, and vice versa. But it seems to me that both sides are symptomatic <coughs> of a deeper pathology that is shared, that is in need of a cure. And I wonder to what extent uh, the, there is a failure on both sides to diagnose properly what is the problem. I and mean, in the history of medicine, people often mistreated things, and misdiagnosed, because they misdiagnosed it, they confuse the symptom with the pathology. How are we collectively left and right misdiagnosing the nature of the problems that ail us? It seems to me whether you are left or right, whether you are the sort of the woke people who have very literal use of language, or the sort of nationalist people who have very figurative use of language, or the people on the left who are looking to a you know utopian future, or the people on the right looking to a sort of halcyon past, whatever the differences are, they both seem to be very dissatisfied with the present. And uh, I wonder whose interests are being served by everyone fighting with each other. It seems to me that you have sort of neoliberal context where you've seen social media emerge, where the money is being made by dividing and ruling, of, of turning each side against each other. Because whether you are someone in so-called flyover country suffering an opioid epidemic or having your job shipped overseas, or you're someone who's 25 living in New York City where you can't afford your rent, you're both being screwed over by the same thing. And yet they hate each other. So I'm wondering, is there a failure to diagnose the problems that ail us? Thank you. Thanks. Is that him? No, uh, um, yeah. that? so uh, the issue of, I guess, uh, what people on both sides call threats to democracy has become an incredibly uh, major issue. I was a journalist uh, in 2020 in Pennsylvania. I covered the election there, and uh, there were a lot of uh, attempts and shenanigans by, uh, by the Trump side to overturn the vote in Pennsylvania. And of course, now there's the prospect that if some of these Pennsylvania Republicans get in, they could try to do the same thing again. And but also you have, of course, that election was overshadowed by the censorship of Hunter Biden's laptop, really on behalf of Democrat-oriented uh, uh, technology companies. 
and uh, as for like this uh, suburban battle that's uh, that's pitching up, I know uh, that uh, book banning and other cultural issues have become uh, a major thing in the schools. But then as we have the abortion issue, so this uh, very important target demographic of uh, suburban women, I guess I just amassed them all the uh, panel like. Are both parties are more, is either party or side, in your view, more of a threat to democracy? If not, why not? And similarly, like, uh, uh, what way, given all the different things, do you think this uh, key demographic block will, uh, will trend in my own state? Lady, behind you there? Hi, thanks. Um, what was the question? Yeah, and you, you made the point about the um, that nobody is standing up for the sort of ideas of the family order. I'm really interested from a UK perspective thinking about the gun control law. I'd really like to hear what you think about that. But it all seems slightly astonishing to me. I mean, well, you know, we have like one school shooting in this country, and straight away our gun laws have changed. But this, the sort of resilience of the gun lobby. And is that, I suppose my question is, is there something actually quite positive about that? Or is it another, just another sort of culture war issue? It, it tells me that there, there may, is something intrinsically positive about people's, um, people sort of sticking with people's resilience and, and sticking with that idea about the rights there are. John, there. Um, I, looking at America from Britain, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a strange thing. We, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, the, the, the viewpoint that we're given is that, uh, you know, Trump is pretty much an idiot and, and so on, and has to be stopped. And that's the, the view from Britain. Um, so, really, my question is, is that. It, it, you know, I'm looking at it from my own point of view. I don't share the British point of view on this. It looks to me as if the state in America is attempting to delegitimize Trump, uh, prevent him running in, in 2024 with all the January 6th hearings and so on, uh, and also his effective censorship uh, once he, he ceased to be president or even before. The end of that presidency, he was censored uh, 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 on on social media. It does appear, you know, is is there such a, a, a thing that we recognise as the deep state, which is looking to uh, promote purely the democratic side? Uh, can we get the mic up to this gentleman here, and then uh, next to the very we'll come back um, yes, I just wanted to raise, we wanted to raise the issue, going back to the title, uh, Can America Survive? Because, um, I want to ask the panel what possible impact the simple cultural wars uh, will have on America's e economic and financial state. Because um, I can't see that the issue about abortion is going to have any direct impact on business, but I could see that movements like BNM would have impact on the economy. The thing is that at the moment, um, you know, America seems to have given up its military role worldwide, but it's still well ahead economically and financially, and it's going to take some time for China to actually catch up. So I want to see whether how much effect these cultural wars are going to have. <laughs> Looking at both sides, um, the very, very sides, or on the Republican side, to what extent will Trump uh, keep his grip on the GOP? Do you see that changing in the um, the, uh, in the, uh, the near future, given his age? Do you think he's uh, going to so up his uh, services to science for this type of change? On the um, on democratic side, Trump, I mean, we think. I was candidate in the sense, well, well, in the only mainstream that I've got, not very excited to attack it, when he came in fact, probably, he probably um, uh, achieved more than we expected him to do. What do you see as the well, future of the question? Has there got anyone like, uh, like, uh, like by who sort of um, could unify a party? It seems to me it's, it, it, it's that the next generation is that. 
Um, Helen, I thought I'd come to you first. There's a few different questions around um, sort of democracy, question of delegitimizing our opponents. So obviously, Trump famously denies the 2020 election result. He's running a platform on, on that. But also you have Biden calling his opponents semi-fascists. Um, you know, this general sense that the other side is not legitimate and not to be engaged with. How do you think that, that could play out in these midterms? I think that's... Right this time. Um, I think that is uh, very much how American politics are at the moment, that essentially people are, um, the, the, the strongest card each party has is demonizing the other side. So for Democrats, what's going to get the vote out for them is to demonize Trump and to basically say, um, you know, we've got to root Trump's candidates um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's the problem and if we can make the whole election about Trump, then um, that can kind of cover it over a multitude of sins that we're not particularly um, dealing with problems. And then the, similarly for, uh, for, for the Republicans, I think they would like this to be a referendum on Biden, and they see Biden and the woke left as the problem. And I think what that means is that um, what I think the danger of the culture war is, and I think this is a, um, it may not seem to sort of work out at the level of Ukraine, but I think you can see increasingly, is the division within America. I think it's a, it's becoming a much more fractured and uh, divided society. I mean, there's even kind of moments when you think, you know, would Texas you know, split off or, but obviously it can't. Austin is in the middle of Texas, which is one of the most liberal cities there is. It's, it's not just a state by state, but the sort of, the, the, the big sort of people just living with people that they agree with, um, and the divide between rural and cities, the divide between the, uh, you know, the, the coasts and what you call the flyover states. I think that division is incredibly damaging for America because it means that there is now no consensus uh, in any kind of way about what it really means to be American. And I think that's where the division, I think it's dangerous. I think it's, it leads to a kind of uh, a chaos which is um, you know, <coughs> unpredictable. And I think that is a, 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 a problem. I think the interesting thing on the, some of the points about democracy, I was just going to come back on that, was that it's traditionally, you know, you think, oh, well, it, in, in America, you always think that the uh, GOP ger gerrymander there, uh, and actually the, the, the Democrats gerrymander their, their kind of um, uh, uh, boundaries so that they can uh, elect their own. One of the interesting things about this election is the general consensus is this is going to be the least influenced by the gerrymandering. It's actually quite a fair division at the moment. It probably won't stay like that, but it is quite fair. So I think what we actually see now, you know, that one issue I think is is not on the table in terms of um, restricting but voting rights in perhaps in, in the way that people have talked about that before. So I was just going to put that out there. The New York Times recently did, did a piece on, you know, congratulating the Democrats on doing enough gerrymandering. To yeah. <laughs> so I think one thing to say is that you know, the notion of culture war in the United States is not new. I mean, famously, Pat Buchanan declared in the 1992 Republican Convention that there was a culture war. Uh, and really, the sense of sharp battles in American politics over questions of identity and social issues throughout the post-war period can be found in the battles over uh, education integration, battles over the involvement of the United States in the Vietnam War, the abortion debate obviously, also debates over school prayer, more laterally, same-sex marriage and so on. Right? So these are not, it's not that the United States has suddenly discovered the culture war takes on uh, different forms. I suppose in one sense perhaps that maybe going back to the original question of Hamill, that could be the sense of sort of a source of some assurance that the United States trundles along throughout history even with these uh, within these battles. Um, on the threats to democracy, I, I think this is perhaps an area that um, is, a, is, is newer um, and might be cause for concern. Of course, there have always been 
voices at certain elections that have <coughs> questioned the outcomes. Going back to the 2000 election, there were certainly some Democrats who didn't think that the election had been properly allocated to George W. Bush, and some Democratic members of the House objected to the certification of electoral college votes in 2000, and a few more in 2004 over controversies over Ohio. Of course, Stacey, Abraham, uh, Stacey Abrams in uh, Georgia famously refused to concede losing the Douglas race a few years ago. But I think this is on a what we're seeing in terms of the denial of the 2020 presidential election by Donald Trump and some of his supporters. And it is on a different level and scale, and I am concerned about how this is becoming a litmus test in many ways within the Republican Party um, and a vital element of democracy that loses consent, and perhaps both sides to different degrees have not fully subscribed to that in the past, but it seems to be really fading now, and I think that's a big concern. Yeah, I wanted to put this uh, woman's point to you. She's talking about you know, Americans, still ordinary Americans, if not their politicians, still um, are very favored of their rights and their arms. I mean, to give another example, a lot of them in certain states didn't tolerate lockdown, not really tolerate the government bossing them about. Isn't there some optimism there? <laughs> no, I will. No? <laughs> Not for me, anyway. Um, no, I mean, the, the very idea that there were lockdowns in the United States of America is so horrific that, yes, about a year after the lockdowns were started, a few people rose up and protested over it. But the very idea that Americans, Democrats, Republicans, anybody, would allow the state to lock them down over a virus is so shadowy that it turned me from optimist to a pessimist about America because uh, I couldn't imagine. I could have, if you told me that there was going to be a virus that primarily kills old people, right? It does. Um, it keeps the young people pretty much safe. Um, then we would lock down the entire society. We would lock down everybody and lock them at home, and the Americans would just shrug and go, fine, that's okay. And then maybe a year later they would remember, oh, maybe we have some liberties, so maybe we have some freedoms, and maybe we should object. Uh, it's just, I would have never predicted that. And indeed, the CDC never predicted it. And it's why in not a single um, plan that the CDC had prepared in advance for pandemics was ever a lockdown ever considered. And in that sense, the West uh, didn't use the CDC manual. They used the Communist Party of China's manual to deal with pandemics. We all became China, like that. China has won the cultural battle, like that. Uh, we're, we're economically moving towards China, and we dealt with the pandemic like China. And it's, it's. Uh, I know this is not a popular view in Europe, but that's that's pretty horrific. Uh, the fact that our individual liberties can be taken away by the government like that by scaremongering us into our homes. And look, I'm not a denier of COVID. I'm vaccinated fully, at least three. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, I'm not a denier that this was an awful virus. But this is like the worst way to deal with it possible. And the fact that of all the individual rights that Americans possess, the one that they are most adamant about is that they can hold on to their M16s is, is not inspiring me. Um, if, if, they, if they held on to their First Amendment as, as strongly as they hold on to those M16s, I would be a lot more inspired. But you're seeing an attack on the First Amendment, a dramatic attack on freedom of speech, and again, we're way ahead of, of, of you guys because you guys have hate speech laws and things that violate free speech right off the bat. But in the United States, um, we're seeing it both on the left and the right. Clearly, Donald Trump was egregiously hostile towards freedom of speech um, uh, to the extent of, of uh, you know, going after Jeff Bezos because he owned the Washington Post, because the Washington Post wrote the story that was negative towards Donald Trump. Um, uh, the left, with its wokeness and its cancel culture, clearly does not believe in freedom of speech. There is a real attack on freedom of speech in the United States today, and uh, I, I wish Americans would be holding on to that. Uh, I think, and, and not to mention separation of state and religion, which I think brings us back maybe to abortion, uh, which uh, which uh, not there's no particularly uh, strong, powerful constituency to hold on to that. The left would like to impose their uh, kind of religion on us 
and the right would, would like to impose their kind of religion on us, but impose religion on us, both parties want to do. Jack, is there anything there you'd like to <laughs> respond to? Um, yeah, from well, the audience. yeah, I'm going to try to hold everything from the audience, but really quick about the COVID. Um, I think it's the cultural way, is that that being a useful way? Yeah, well, first off, China is still in these lockdowns, and the, most US states were out of lockdowns within about two months. So I think that's the biggest difference there. Um, but so I want to touch on everything. So uh, to the guns real quick. So the Second Amendment is the right to bear arms. And the reason you don't see, one of the reasons you don't see big uh, gun reform after these mass shootings, which are uniquely American, and have causes from mental health to media sensationalism, and you go into that. But it, it's law-abiding gun owners who don't want to be punished for these one-off psychos, which I'm a little sympathetic toward. Now, assault rifles, that's a whole other question. Um, so that's the Second Amendment. The fourth and or sorry, the Third Amendment is that the government is not allowed to quarter soldiers in your home. So that just gives you a little sense on, yes, the Bill of Rights is great, but you know, it's not like that everything in it is worth defending through that. Um, and then uh, with uh, the election and election deniers, um, there was a poll recently that one third of Republicans um, would like their candidate to concede if they're to lose. So only one third of people think, one third of Republicans think that their candidate should concede if they lose, and about half of the Democrats. So that just shows you where uh, faith in elections is diminishing, and that's probably the, the biggest uh, point I'm pessimistic about in the future. Um, also, in these midterms, a lot of people don't realize that there are a lot of state elections too, so governor races, secretary of state for states, <laughs> they have elections uh, coming up, and those secretary of states for each state are in charge of administering elections. And there are, uh, I think, about a dozen uh, Trump backed Secretary of State candidates who have said explicitly that they would not certify their state's results if they had the same sort of anti Trump results in 2020. So that, I think, is concerning. Um, let's see. Uh, the military, I would push back on the fact that the US military is in decline. Um, it's still, um, I think, second most allocated. Um, item in budget, um, some almost $900 billion a year goes to our military. And like I said earlier, we have $65 billion worth of funding to Ukraine. I think about 40 or 45 of that is military. And the javelins and other equipment have, have proven really successful. We have long range uh, missiles or missile uh, defense systems on the way. Um, Let's see. Uh, for the Democrats, for the Biden successor, uh, I don't think there's a clear um, person for who that would be. It's not Kamala Harris. She's very unpopular. Um, people will suggest Pete Buttigieg, who's the current transportation secretary. Before he was transportation secretary, he was the mayor of the third largest state in Indiana. So he doesn't have many credentials. I think most likely is that Biden will um, make a decision around the first year if he's going to run again. And if he's not going to run again, they'll probably be the primary. Um, the governor of California. Yes. Yeah, the new so he has a little bit more credentials, but again, I mean, he'll probably run. We'll, we'll see. Um, and then with Trump, I think his fate depends on uh, his candidates in the midterms. So um, if his candidates do well, uh, I think he'll run. If they don't do well, he, he might run still, but I think we'll have a lot less clout in the Republican Party. And just real quick, it's, it's also totally abnormal for a failed presidential candidate to still have this much power of his party. It, it's ridiculous. Mitch McConnell, Mitch McConnell, since January 6th, has distanced himself completely from Trump. I don't think they've spoken at all. Kevin McCarthy condemned him on January 7th, and then about a month later was down in Mar-a-Lago talking to Trump. Um, and he is in line to be the Speaker of the House if Republicans are to win. Um, let's see. Okay, all right. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, let's uh, go on to the audience again. There's a couple of things I'm conscious we haven't quite touched on yet. Um, things like crime, Black Lives Matter, the climate, uh, another big culture war issue, even though people pretend it's about science. Um, <laughs> then, uh, right there. Have we got two mics down here and one upstairs? Okay, so let's, let's have this person. Sorry, this person here, and then you with your hand up upstairs, and then we should bring it down. Yeah, just a quick question on the culture war debate. I haven't completely got my head around it because, on the one hand, I can see that 
the way that it's presently constituted is enormously divisive, and that is enormously problematic. I completely get that and understand that. But obviously, one reaction might be okay, let's just all be friendly and ignore this stuff, which I don't think works. I mean, it isn't the paradox that in the way we need to have a culture war on different kinds of issues. So, for example, so rather than identity politics, we need some kind of uh, na national politics to frame within an American national framework. We need a culture war. You mentioned there on free speech. Uh, we could have a culture war on free speech, a pro free speech uh, culture war. Uh, on the climate thing that Fraser mentioned, uh, to say, well, in fact, what we really need is economic prosperity. We're overly concerned about the climate. We do need to wage a culture war on prosperity. So, am I right in thinking that per se, a culture war is not a bad thing, but we need to have on the right issues with the aim of uniting the population rather than just dividing it unnecessarily? And yet, yeah, upstairs, <coughs> just, to, just a quick one. Uh, Greg Dalio recently said we put the odds of civil war at 30%. Uh, <laughs> it's not like Tim Pool, and he's probably going to put it down the way. It's probably a near certainty. Where do you sit on that scale? Slightly so a civil war? Interesting. Uh, yeah, Danny? Um, yeah, I've heard the Americans speak about civil war. I mean, I've walked with the community in Spain, I've met a few Americans. A couple of them talked about civil war. Uh, I thought I was a bit exaggerating with myself, but what I see is um, have we reached a peak woke? Um, you know, I mean, basically, we seem to have reached a peak woke in this country. Uh, the apology we've come up, um, over what she said about supercultural rights towards the uh, uh, and the, the response to the Labour Party, which was to say, yes, this is racism, uh, and we suppose it. Uh, immediately challenges the most extreme interpretations of physical race theory. And so that's that line has been drawn there. Um, that's the Labour Party's first response to that. The Conservative Party has already been uh, responding to it with um, legislation over trans rights or trans legislation. And also, um, what we might imagine might be Conservative support of the North Football fans who Challenge the uh, uh, So we've reached the globe. We've, you know, it's obvious that uh, our authorities have realised this is the case. Maybe the Americans have also realised this is the case. If so, what's the alternative? I mean, it seems that wokeness was a response to the um, the way that uh, liberal democracy didn't actually work as it was planned to. It didn't cope with what was going on after the Second World War in the 1960s and coping with the official racism that they had. Uh, but that's changed now, and the situation has changed, even though we've got Donald Trump. So, what's the, is the way back, going back towards the Constitution, going back towards the American Constitution and liberal democracy, and ultimately religion, because these are you know, these are the unifying factors in, in social life. Uh, or is there any more scope for more wokeness and more individuality and more isolation and nationalisation? Um, I'd just like to ask you all. Uh, can you pass it kindly? Yeah. Um, I was wondering, um, recently uh, there was a picture on social media of um, Kanye West wearing the White Lives Matter uh, t shirt, I think it was. Um, and I was wondering what you thought the role of like uh, celebrities um, and sort of like I don't know, what kind of Twitter discourse was. I don't know if that's just a thing of like people in my generation or like Gen Z millennials, but um, in terms of cultural war, I think that's like a very uh, it's another catalyst. Is it? Do you have the woman there with her hand up? Further back there. Yeah. Wait. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask if you think it's possible to break the consensus in the society regarding the political issues, how the impact of, uh, and how the role of the government and <coughs> the size of the state. And if you think it's possible, which will be the best and most effective way? And could we might, yeah, pass the mic back to the woman there, and someone has the mic up there, is that right? Yeah, yeah. do you want to speak now? Um, I don't uh, honestly see how the US can avoid civil war, to be honest, I know it's 
much of a trendy thing, but it has been obvious for a while that there are two Americas, and these two Americas cannot coexist. Either America is a country of freedom uh, founded on the, you know, the principles of revolution, or it is a white supremacist project that exists on the back of slavery. These two idealizations of America cannot coexist. And the way to negotiate any chance of them coexisting is rapidly breaking down, as we are seeing with the delegitimization of democratic processes. My question is, how could any of you see a way forward that does not involve mass violence? Uh, yeah, like that. Just a very quick one. Is this that we hate Donald Trump and... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, Jack, I'm going to start with you. An easy question. Okay. Civil War. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll start with the, the last one. Um, so I'm not a supporter of Donald Trump. Um, and he had some policies that, um, that actually, even on the international stage, definitely led the US and I would say the world. He was big on um, having other NATO countries increase their spending. He brought uh, the Democrats along with him, opposing China. Um, I, I would say since January 6th, um, since he uh, said, uh, told his attorney general, his White House counsel, um, many of his aides, and about a dozen, dozens actually, of federal judges that they were wrong and that he actually had one, that, that's when I got to the point where I don't want this guy close to politics ever again. Um, and back, like kind of to pig piggyback on that, um, with, with the Civil War uh, question, I think civil war um, would be more likely with Trump back in the White House or running again in 2024 as a Republican nominee. Because obviously, if he loses in 2024, uh, assuming that he runs against a Democrat in the general election, he will not accept the results. And I think that he'll uh, encourage his supporters, similar to how he did in 2020, to uh, not accept them at any cost. And I think that's where it gets dangerous. Um, outside of Trump, I don't think that the US is close to civil war. Um, it's kind of interesting to talk about, but um, I don't think that there is a, I don't think that you would have these large armed factions going against each other. Um, like I mentioned kind of earlier in my opening, there's a, a lot more consensus in Congress than people realize. Um, take this infrastructure package, for example, uh, like I said, the aid to Ukraine, even the COVID bills, were, which was overspending, but at least it was bipartisan overspending. Um, I think the media sensationalizes um, everything that happens in, in the U.S. politics and the extremes, the progressive Democrats and the Trump Republicans are made to represent the right and left, which is not the case. In reality, they represent about 15% each of the electorate, which is surely a minority. And I think Biden's presidency, while I don't agree with all his policies, um, represents a more moderated version of American politics and a version of American politics where civil war is not possible. Yeah, I mean, is it, is it worth thinking about the fact that most Americans are surely not die-hard Trumpistas or blue-haired woke horrors either, and you know, probably not going to want to pick up a gun to defend either of those uh, positions? Well, Aren't most people normal and have normal, you know, idiosyncratic views on a range of issues? Definitely people are normal, most people are normal, and, and the, the fact that, you, you know, we, we color these states red and blue, but in every red state, there are big pockets of blue, and in every blue state, there are big pockets of red. And a civil war is not between the states, because as somebody said, Texas, Austin, Texas, uh, which is in many regards, uh, kind of the heart of Texas, is very, very blue, right? It's very, very democratic. So so the, the, the civil war would be within the states, it wouldn't be across the states. I don't see much prospects of a civil war, because I, I will say, with regard to, uh, with regard to uh, uh, the scary part is that such a large percentage of Republicans who support Trump are, uh, you know, willing to reject the election, right? Are willing to overthrow an election in order to bring him back to power. That is the one. I think with, with Trump out of the equation, I agree, civil war is very unlikely. On the other hand, not to be too optimistic. Um, on the other hand, I think American decline is 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 an error. That is, I do think America is declining, and this relates to the question about cultural war related to economics. I think it certainly does, because I think the cultural war distracts from the fact that America is in decline economically. Economic growth in America, everybody cheered when Donald Trump said we had the greatest economy in history. Could we grow it 2% a year? Pathetic. <laughs> That's all I can say about that. 
Um, uh, American economy is a decline, and uh, the only good thing one could say is the Chinese economy is in decline even more so, right? So I think global economy is, is going to be troubled for the next few decades. Um, and again, this is all kind of distracting from the real challenge which we face, which you mentioned uh, regarding the Civil War, um, which is, what is America? Is America the principles of liberty and freedom and individual liberty and so on, uh, which is supposedly one side, I'm not sure which side, because I don't think that is represented at all on the American political map today. Or is America woke? Or is America, as uh, what's her name, uh, the, the congresswoman from Georgia said, is America a, uh, a Christian nation? Uh, you know, a, a fundamentally Christian. So you've got tribalism on the one side, left tribalism and right tribalism on the one side, which is Democrats and Republicans both are now tribal and collectivistic and anti-American constitution of the Bill of Rights. And I, by the way, would be willing to fight to the death of the Bill of Rights. Um, you know, it's important. Yes, you might find one aspect of it to be irrelevant, but there are a number of aspects that, that, that keep the country alive and keep, I think, Western civilization going. But the, the, both those aspects, both left and right today are tribal. And there is no representative on the political map today, or on the cultural map, not just the political map, the cultural map, for the individualism represented by the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. There's no representative for the kind of individualism represented even by somebody who I consider relatively mediocre, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan could not win in the Republican Party today. And that is a travesty. Now, Ronald Reagan is not my ideal, right? But he's sure is better than anybody else in the Republican Party right now. What about Kanye West? <laughs> oh, yeah, let me just say something about Kanye West. I mean, Kanye West, is, it, it's sad because I, I think Kanye West has real mental problems. <laughs> no, this is not funny. I'm not meaning this as a joke. This is documented. He's, he's got bipolar or whatever it is. The guy is mentally not there. And the fact that we we idolize him and put him on a, on a, on a pedestal does not help his mental problems. Uh, it would be good if he got treatment and we didn't worship him. I think generally, who the hell cares what a singer, as good as he might be, I don't get him, but as good as he might be, thinks about anything. Why do we care about what singers and movie actors or sports figures think about politics? They're irrelevant to the political debate. I mean, they're relevant because People admire them be above and beyond anything reasonable. But, you know, they are not shaping the world. They're shaping the world of the intellectuals. But are shaping the world of the professors at universities and public pundits. And uh, even the politicians don't shape the world. They just, they, in a sense, they're just mouthpieces for the intellectuals behind them. So if you want, if you want somebody to object to and if you want guidance, it's always been the intellectuals. It's all, that, that's where it comes from. And uh, these celebrities, I couldn't care less what any of them say. Maybe if some of them said something rational and reasonable, that would be nice. But given that they almost always, whatever side they happen to be on the political map, unreasonable and completely, uh, you know, completely nuts, why would I care? <laughs> um, Richard, I mean, one of the one of the sort of themes that's been coming up is that there are areas of kind of we have consensus in Congress over big economic issues. The Supreme Court, obviously, not elected, um, and in fact, at odds with majority of, of opinion on the big issue of abortion. I mean, does that contribute? Do you think to the kind of tenor of the culture wars, the sort of the rage that is often behind it, the fact that people feel that they actually can't? Influence anything? Yeah, so two, two points there, I think. First is to say that Biden has attempted to, in terms of his legislative agenda, has tried to keep all of these social issues and cultural war questions out of his legislative agenda. And part of that is because of the reality of the narrowness of his majorities in, in Congress. Um, added to that with the filibuster that uh, for most pieces of legislation, Biden would need 10 Republican senators to agree to anything that he put through uh, law. The exception there is with certain uh, finance tools, which he uses this reconciliation process through, and that's how he's pushed through some major spending bills. Now, I don't think there is consensus on these things, because every single Republican voted against 
uh, Biden's um, uh, last major spending bill. So there's that. In a way, I suppose, as someone I'm generally a critic of anti-majoritarian rules like the filibuster. The filibuster, in some ways, does limit the ability of either side, really, to push contentious legislation through. And I think in some ways that is a bad thing for America, because I think you put, you put things through, and then you have an election um, to uh, hold people accountable for whether or not that was a good decision or not. The, the, the court is, has been a, has been a long-running um, way of taking certain issues out of the political system. And the abortion one is, is obviously the, the most salient and, 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 and fascinating in, in many ways, where basically Roe v. Wade allowed Republican legislators to use, uh, to, to pass laws that were highly restrictive on abortion, that spoke to their core constituency, in the core Republican primary voters, knowing that these laws would not go into effect because they were contrary to the Supreme Court decision and yet get the credit in the primary election. I suppose in a way what we have now is now that the decision has returned the abortion question back to the states and in some cases these laws have now been triggered into effect. These legislators are the dog that caught the car. And I think it's going to be very interesting because about a third of Republican voters uh, believe in access to abortion in, in some form and yet 0% of Republicans in the House, and just two Republicans in the Senate, uh, are, are, are pro-choice in, in, in any form. And so I think there will be a battle now within the Republican Party in a way that there hadn't been before on, on the question of abortion. I'll be fascinated to see how that goes. Um, um, I was going to try and... Oh, there's, there's a couple of positive things uh, that I can think about America. I think that... Um, uh, a lot of Americans um, have a great sense of their rights, and I think it is a rights-driven society. And I think that then sets up certain um, uh, quite interesting um, uh, kind of happenings, which I think we can be quite positive about. I do think that the uh, resistance of uh, certain parents to being having a school curriculum that was, you know. Um, very much uh, governed by uh, critical race theory, um, in that that happened. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of weird stuff said about critical race theory, but I think the fact that parents felt that they wanted to have control over what their kids were doing, I think is a very American response, that you feel that you have parental rights, you have authority over your children, and in that sense, um, there, there are some really great things about America, which is that when you kind of hope when you kind of take away their rights, people do react. And I think it isn't just a kind of quote thing. So I think there are areas for positiveness. I see the same thing on abortion. I think it's like the, the kind of debate in politics about abortion was one thing. But I think that, you know, young women think they have the right to have an abortion. And they feel that that is a right. Um, and it's something that is worth uh, trying to fight on. And, and, and in fact, They've not even um, been mobilized for so long, precisely because it's taken out of their control. And I think that, in fact, the fact that young women, you know, my daughter, is outraged. She says they're treating me like a vessel. You know, I mean, she's like, there's her friends are just really uh, do not feel that they their autonomy should be um, taken away from them. And that may be the same sentiment that makes people hang on to guns. I think it, it is that sort of sense that you have certain rights and being an American means that you have certain rights. And so I think that's a very positive thing about America. Um, I think there was, I wanted to come in on this peak woke thing, though. this is a bit more negative. I, I, I think that the uh, woke agenda in uh, America is very much driven by identity politics. And I think that the, um, you know, while you have people who see themselves as autonomous and having rights, and they at the same time, you have an obsession with identity and self, sort of narcissistic way of looking at those things. And I think that all I can see is identity politics spreading. I think, you know, in, in many ways, the way that the uh, 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 MAGA people talk about being white is almost like it becomes another identity. It's, so it's not just that, you know, it's 
um, colleges and campuses and all of that where people are thinking about identity. I think that in every um, uh, kind of sphere of life, it's not that there's, these, there's people who are immune to it. And so I think that when you have that dominance of identity culture, and it really is ingrained in, in, in American culture, it does obviously divide people up because you get divided around your identity. And I think it means that the sort of, it may not be called woke, it may be called something else, but I think that sort of sense that um, we're vulnerable, we're victims, we're, you know, we, we have to look after our identity, we don't share things. I think that that's the flip side of it. I think there's an intrinsic sense of people wanting to, you know, don't like their rights being taken away. But on the other hand, there is a, uh, a growth of identity politics, which I think will mean that whatever it's called, wokeness or whatever, is, is, is quite a way to go. Okay, let's have some more audience questions. There's someone right at the back. <laughs> Who the hell said that off? <laughs> <laughs> still going over 20 minutes, who knows? They're not picking us out. Um, yeah, that person there. Yeah, yeah, woman there. A um, variation on the Civil War. Can you stand up um, so that the camera can see you? Yeah, a variation on the question of the Civil War thing. Um, I saw a poll, well, I heard a publication of a poll back in the 2020 elections where. 40% or so of uh, the country said they would want to see if, or well, who's in California, if uh, uh, Democrats won, and a similar number of Democrats would want to see uh, if the Republicans, you know, Trump won. Um, I wondered just where secessionist movements were, where they are up and down, it's more or less where they've always been. And I just wonder also if you could comment on some, a comment I recently heard. I think it was Douglas Murray, the spectator, or someone like that, said that in his view now, American politics was mostly about just inflicting maximum pain on the other side. These the secession polls sound a bit like those celebrities who said they were going to leave when you know, they got the Trump. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, up there, you've got a question? Yes, I'd like to ask the panel. Um, when I watch Joe Biden speak, he, like, Obviously, the, the, there's clips about him. It doesn't seem like he's all there. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and I just wonder. It, it doesn't fill me. It doesn't fill me with confidence with all the issues that have happened all right now. And then if I look at his number two, Kamala Harris, she's even more ridiculous. Like, I've listened to her talk, and she also doesn't make any sense. And I just want to find out, like. Is, are that, are, does Biden actually have a lot of influence with the decisions that the way America is going? And um, and on Trump, with uh, him not conceding to the election, uh, I'm not saying I sympathise with him, but I just wondered if I, if I was him and I, I see like when the the emails of Hillary Clinton happened, there was no investigation then. When um, Joe Biden's laptop came out, it was just completely censored. And I just wondered, like, he, him and his supporters, especially when you see it on the news media, they get sensationalized with these stories that they are hiding the truth, why are they doing this, you know, why is this? And then, then it rallies, it kind of, you know, encourages them to think that there's a conspiracy against them. And I, I feel that maybe Trump feels that, and that's why he doesn't believe that he lost the, the election because if they did, if they did hide those other things, what else are they hiding? Is there anyone else upstairs who wants to ask a question? By the way, can we bring the mic down? No, you, you, you've already spoken. Uh, can we bring the mic downstairs because there's loads of people want to talk here? Um, let's. Who's got the mic? Can we get it over to this gentleman in the white shirt? Oh yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. Right. Um, question really for Richard, for anybody is. Um, do you not think that DeSantis is a contender? Because culturally, he seems to be, in some way, more in touch with the base, with the Christian base, but perhaps more broadly than Trump is. And he has the advantage of being you know, under 75. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's get Mike over here. Yeah, Mike, you want to ask a question? I am surprised listening to the, uh, the panel 
because there seems to be no sympathy for Donald Trump at all. And surely, you just you see, it seems to me like 40% of the American population in the market did in San Francisco has been expressed. Now, specifically, America does seem to have problems with his, like, the, the mechanisms for conducting his votes. Um, the, the hanging trial, like, type of situation, George Bush's brother, George his cousin, you know, like, it was a corporate <coughs> first, you know, like, at the, uh, in, like, in the Florida, like, <coughs> But my understanding is that Trump's position is that at the end of the voting, like, the polls show that he, like, he'd, uh, like, he's been successful. Come next morning, uh, there was a, a massive controversy about the postal votes. That there's a, you know, he believes he's got a prima facie case because the, um, the Nesta Sousa 2000 mule still, like, like, provides evidence of, uh, uh, like, of irregularities regarding the postal like, votes paid for by Democratic, uh, 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 you know, support celebrities. Right, so we have got to well, shake your head, right? But the point of fact is that there's an awful lot of people that believe that, right? And that hasn't been examined, like, with any like, degree to a forensic like, manner in which, like, uh, you know, like in which the, um, say, the Trump case, like, regarding Mar a Lago papers are. And that's the type of thing that's going to, I should imagine, fuel a certain amount of resentment. But, yeah, so, I mean, like I said, practically, we're not just sort out what voting system is, so that there's so that there's <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm like this in on paper and sports hall, and yeah. no one will contest it. That's the system. 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 That's it's easy to say that we're all in our own echo chamber on social media and like on whatever else, but the point of fact is, like, there are those different TV channels and you can't be able to look at them. And my experience with Facebook is that I'm falling out of people's face actively. But, the point of fact is, no, 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 no. the point being is you have access to alternative points of view. But I'm that, so the populisms are all there. And the, the, the panel not have hope that the, 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 the Opportunities and structures exist within America so people can exchange ideas and uh, there is hope for the future. Okay, just sit from the ladies behind you and then, yeah, this lady and then, and then the man. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm just going to keep about your point about Kanye West saying that he's been successful in but I think it's naive to think that people like Kanye and Taylor Swift, for instance, don't have huge amounts of influence because when she tweeted, millions of actually a disenfranchised age group went out and voted for the Democrats. So, uh, so I think that point is a little bit, I would say, naive. Um, my big point is about abortion, which I don't think actually is a cultural issue. I think it's a medical one, and it affects 50% of the population, and there's a whole swathe of people, particularly in America, where there's that picture of Donald Trump with a member height and signing away abortion rights for women. I actually don't think it's a cultural issue, and I actually think that if you got rid of, I don't think it would have happened, but if the whole of the United States decided to ban abortion, to the gentleman's point over there that it's not a cultural issue, it's not an economic issue, I can tell you that the economy of America falls to the floor, and there's all the women who are basically working in Amazon and um, factories and fast food restaurants and looking after your children and your old people, are not going to be able to do any of that because they're looking after all the kids they can't, they don't, they can't afford. And, uh, and therefore, I would like to say, please, let's take abortion out of the cultural issue world and start talking about this medical issue for 50% of the population and you then just step out of that bloody conversation and not talk about it. Thank you. Well, we're going to have to talk about it because the evangelicals made it an issue. Yes. They have turned it into a cultural issue, even if it is a medical one. Uh, yeah. First of all, is that working? Yeah. yeah. First of all, on, on somebody's uh, wrong way. Mine is not the wrong way. Short time is the biggest one. Okay. And the second quick question is is Tulsi ever? Finish. If, if I were the Republicans, I'd be thinking, let's get her in, see where this goes. Uh, I, I just wonder whether that's actually a possibility. And the third point is that there's a, a lot of self loathing in American politics. It's really irritating uh, to hear. For instance, it happens with the Second Amendment. I, I agree with the people that say there's something also about the Second Amendment. And also, you know, this, whenever you have a, a, a sort of shooting going on, 
we have this music of all words, of all words happens to us. But only in America do we have this. Actually, we have a bigger school shooting in the week and a half uh, in Thailand, which of course has much more on the So, uh, but all of the biggest shootings have, have been in different places: Pakistan, uh, Kenya, uh, France, Pakistan, uh, and yet Americans go, oh, oh, we it only happens to us because we're so stupid and we have guns. And I think that there's this element of self-loathing, American-centered sort of self-loathing that goes through politics, and I just wondered what people thought of that as a factor. The best and most evil country in the world, simultaneously. Um, yeah, let's get some over here. Get a mic. Can we get one mic right up to the front, and then to slowly afterwards? Hi, um, so your point about the um, people shooting schools and how they're an odd nutcase, it's not one odd nutcase because they're happening almost every week. And as a 16 year old, I can assure you, school is supposed to be where I learn and where I should be safe. I shouldn't have to go to school with a what is essentially a bullet shield in my backpack. Um, so how is it fair that the tiny majority of people who are using self-defense and then everyone else who is suffering because of it, how is it fair on those who suffer? Can you pass my back to the lady there? And who else wants to ask a question? Uh, can we get the other mic to this gentleman with the glasses? So keep the back watch, yeah. I have a question about the deep state. Um, not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but somebody raised it behind me. Because the fact is, people say, oh, Trump never uh, accepted the result of the election. Hillary Clinton and her supporters have never accepted yes. the yes. result yes. of the election. Yes. And then people say, oh, well, he didn't win the popular vote. That's not the system. The system is the electoral college. And if you disagree with the electoral college, you have plenty of opportunities to have campaigned against it. But my question is, um, that, um, okay, so Trump disagreed with the electoral result. Uh, there are two things. Number one, number one the way his home, in, uh, his home was uh, invaded by the FBI, which seems to be acting as a wing of the Democratic Party now, which it's not supposed to do. Um, you know, um, it, it's supposed to be at least, in terms of public view, um, independent. But the other thing is the way the, uh, the people who protested on January the 6th, um, let's call it a riot uh, or whatever, and, uh, uh, and uh, in, invaded. Um, you can disagree with their tactics, but the fact is, um, there's no evidence that any of them were armed. The only person that died during the protest was a, uh, a woman who was retired from the military, who was shot, um, by a nervous member of the security services. So my question is, um, in, I, I know I agree that both sides try to delegitimate the other, but it does seem that the state is actively now involved in this process of demonization. And the fact that, by, you know, by the Hunter, uh, what's his name? Oh, Hunter, Hunter, Hunter Biden, that's right, yeah. The fact that Hunter Biden um, you know, was never really brought to task over the laptop. All the illegal dealings in terms of contracts he was able to secure as a result uh, of his association with the president. I think we need to ask these questions because these questions have, uh, you know, have consequences for democracy. And the way I see it, it's not so much that there's going to be a civil war, although I think people in the UK like that idea because they think that we're all gun toting, toting, toting. Uh, Americans who are, you know, just ready to shoot it out because they watch too many cowboy films. That's why. Um, but I think it's, what we're seeing is much more of a fragmentation, and that there's a desire for the middle ground. Most Republicans support abortion under certain circumstances. Most Democrats support that we should have the right to bear arms. But you know, obviously, we all support that people should be should be vetted. vetted. There's a desire for the common ground, but what you're seeing is a fragmentation and a depoliticization, which is really, really dangerous, almost a balkanization uh, politically. 
Thank you. So much for people who are going to come and take this party to us. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Who's right at? Yes. Anyone? Who's right at? Who's right at? Anyone? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Presentations about culture war in America. And I see a big difference between the culture war in America and the culture war in the UK. In America, it seems to me it's a great, there are two sides and they're both pushing. In Britain, it seems to me, by contrast, there's only one side pushing and the other side is rolling over. So we've had 12 years of conservative government. We have critical race theory in schools, trans ideology in schools. People are being sacked from their jobs, a nurse, a teacher, a railway worker, for going for ideological reasons. We have people being arrested by the police for crime, for misgendering somebody on Twitter, for retweeting a meme, arrested, taken off the police station. It seems to be in the UK, unlike in America, and I like what Helen said about some of the school boards pushing back. It seems to me that only there is, there are people here in, this, um, in these various meetings today who are pushing back, but in British politics, there is nobody like, say, Ron DeSantis, nobody like um, Tulsi Gabbard. There's just one side pushing, and the other side, I mean, you mentioned one, one speaker mentioned Boris. Boris just rolls over. There is no, there's no culture war here. There's one side pushing, and the other side of using. Kenny Bateman. Kenny, uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, over there. Over there. You spoke in the head. Right. So, um, I've got many things here. Um, one, uh, one, well, there are two things I want to address. First, um, about COVID, yes, it mostly only affected or it was worse than all people. But when it first came and nobody knew what it was about, and a lot of people were caught off guard. Uh, it did affect a lot of young people, and to this day you have a uh, number of under 30 people on capacity of a 70 year chronic smoker. Rare, but yeah, the, the subsequent variants were far less aggressive. True. But now, on to my other point abortion. First thing is uh, abortion was, as uh, we talked about, as an issue that pertains to um, bodily autonomy. All well and good, but the same people that uh, talk about abortion and bodily autonomy seem to forget bodily autonomy when it comes to enforcing vaccinations. If we're going to enforce one type of bodily autonomy, we have to enforce the other. If we're going to be against the other. Um, it also seems that when we talk about abortion, uh, there, there seems to be a secret consensus on the definition of women because they all, people say it's, a, it's about women's rights. So there is a uh, uh, some consensus on the definition of women that involves the capacity or the need to have an abortion. And ultimately, an abortion, we talk about abortion, 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 the right to do it, uh, but I never hear anyone talking about uh, having more access to information, as in, first, access to contraception, making contraception uh, techniques more accessible, but also access to information as in more sex education, especially to the younger players, uh, educating on what they are going to do that might land their pregnancy, but also education on uh, should you uh, have an abortion, what sort of damage will happen in your body and damage that can have short, mid, and long term consequences. So, having more information available. I never hear you all talking about that, just not the abortion in and of itself. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, Let's, have, let's get in one more question and make it really quick. And please, yeah, there we go. Okay, really quick. Where do you think the Latino vote will go? Bringing it back to the midterms, because the yeah. rumor is that it's going more towards the Republicans, which would make a big difference. Okay, um, let's get our panel to sort of sum up, and it'd be great if you could, you know, bring it back to the kind of midterms, the, to the culture war, rather than the abortion, good or bad. <laughs> Guns, good or bad. Um, Helen. Um, the Latino book. The uh, Latino book, I think, is really interesting, and I think that what's happened, I don't think actually very much has changed in the Latino book. I think there's just been a realization that the Democrats' dream that uh, democracy is destiny, you know, that if you're a person of colour or you're, you know, some kind of identity, you know, a, a 
minority group, then you're automatically a, a Democrat. I think that that's now realized that that's a, a stupid idea um, because people are equal. And in fact, there's quite a lot of, um, going back to abortion, there are quite a lot of uh, 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 Latino voters who vote in a conservative manner precisely because of abortion. You know, they are Catholic and they have those views. Um, and I think that uh, I think the Democrats, you know, with Obama, had this idea that the future of America was going to be this rainbow world, which could only possibly go Democrat because it would become more and more a rainbow coalition, and it would become more and more democratic. Uh, Democrat. Um, whereas I think now, uh, whereas I think uh, the African American uh, community votes pretty solidly Democrat. I don't think any other other groups do. So I think the Latino vote, it's not like it's becoming more Republican, it's just that it's a bigger section of the vote and now people realize that on average usually about 35% of Latinos uh, vote Republican. Um, so it's, uh, it's, I think that's where that's going. So it's, but it's more that that's, there's been a realization on that. Um, I, I, I really didn't want to give the impression that I'm a kind of uh, flag waving for Biden and, and um, you know, didn't understand some of the things about Trump. I think the difficulty is, is that we look at Britain and we think you had this wonderful expression of freedom and populism in, in Brexit and that was just a beautiful thing and we got Trump, you know, it was not quite so beautiful. Um, and I think the, 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 the point about Trump, which is why I think he is an important person and why it's quite difficult to see who would replace him, is that he um, he basically recognised that the, the high degree of um, alienation and distrust that existed amongst working class you know, men in America, and I think that he he um, you know basically forged that coalition and forced that agenda, forced those people to be kind of put back on the agenda and to be heard, and I think that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why um, you know he was so successful was that he was able to kind of um, uh, do that. I think the the uh, the problem with that though is that he, he that's why there's his particular voting block is so distrustful. It isn't that like everybody you know it's, it's an accident that all of his voters think that he was you know uh, fiddled out of the vote and there was fraud. That's where they're coming from. It's a level of distrust in the system, a level of distrust that um, you know just is quite uh, profound. And I think that increasingly, uh, you know, now we recognise that there is this very large majority, uh, minority of about thirty percent of Americans who feel very unheard. And DeSantis, you know, will he be able to pick those up? I don't know. We're going to wind up. So. Uh, uh, Trump is also great for the news business. Every time he says something, <laughs> you sell a story. So I, I love him on that front. <laughs> Basically, bullied our panel into being nice about Trump. <laughs> uh, Richard, your final thoughts? Yeah, so just on, on Trump, I guess, yeah. important. I think that he, in 2016, made important critiques about the Democratic Party's embrace of globalization and a certain economic model and it clearly failed broad areas of the country. And I think that you see that the Biden administration has quietly accepted certain parts of that critique, particularly with the Biden Made in America push, Biden's choice <coughs> on trade, Biden's hawkish niche on China, uh, and, and so on. The Biden administration doesn't trumpet it as, as much, but I, I think that, that is a, that's a legacy of an important, I think, positive contribution that, 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 that Trump made. He exposed a, a terrible neglect of the Democratic Party of, of, of key uh, electorate. Um, the attempt to bring down Trump through a sort of semi legal process over the last several years, I think, has also been a mistake for Democrats. I think that the impeachment attempts were a distraction, uh, and they were never going to succeed. And enormous amounts of energy were expended on them, and really Democrats should have been building a political alternative and objection to, to Trump. Um, and I think in some ways this latest investigation risks again being another distraction 
uh, for a, a sideshow from the Democrats actually being able to build an alternative political message. That all being said, I don't, I don't accept the, the comment that Hillary Clinton didn't accept that she lost the 2016 election. Didn't like that she lost it, and she did sort of make comments about Russia and so on. But she did concede the election. She did go to his inauguration, um, and I think that Trump's behavior after 2020. First of all, it was not necessary. Trump did not need to do that, uh, right? I think he, he could have been a very credible candidate for the next election without having to go down any of that line. In some ways, I think it's weakened him politically. Yeah. I do think that people like DeSantis pose a threat to him. I think he's still the, the front runner for the nomination. Um, but I, I don't think that he needed to do any of that. I think it was a, it was a, it was a terrible mistake. Thanks. Gary. <laughs> So um, let me just clarify, uh, I am very opposed to Trump, I've been opposed to Trump from 2015 on, uh, the fact that he didn't concede the election wasn't surprising at all, he told us he wouldn't concede it in advance, uh, he is the worst thing to happen in American politics, maybe ever, uh, he has destroyed the Republican Party as a credible alternative to the Democrats. Uh, I'm almost as anti-Biden and Hillary Clinton as I am anti-Trump, so it's not like I'm for these others because I'm anti-Trump. Uh, I, am, I am for an alternative to both. I, I, I disagree uh, uh, with my uh, fellow panelists here because I think that what Biden has done is took the worst of Trump's policies um, and, uh, and uh, doubled up on them. Uh, globalization was one of the greatest things that's ever happened to the Western world. Uh, we have benefited massively from globalization, and I know this is an unpopular view today, both on left and right, but we've all are far better off because of globalization, and the move against, away from globalization, is one that we are going to regret uh, for, for a very long time. So, um, it's not that I uh, am ignoring 40% of the population who support Trump. I'm ignoring 90% of the population. <laughs> <laughs> and the people who support Biden. I think they're all wrong. And this is the point I was trying to make, and I'll end with this because we're running out of time. The, ultimately, the fundamental question for America is, is it the land of the Declaration of Independence? Is it about individualism? Is it about liberty? Is it about freedom? And there is no political voice today for that perspective. At the left and the right are the same when it comes to their collectivistic view of what America is about. It's all about tribes, it's all about groups, it's all about identity politics. Because I agree completely, whether it's white or, or alternative. Uh, and there is no voice today for the, the, the core ideas that made America what it is today. And in that sense, America will suffer economically as it evolves away from the land of entrepreneurs and the land of individuals. Uh, Alright, so I'm going to just briefly touch on Trump. I, I'm not just like Trump hating, Biden loving, whatever. I almost voted for Trump. The reason I didn't was because I thought Biden would be a lot more unified. He hasn't been. So, there we go. Um, I like to think of Trump as a chemo. He, he, know, he saw the political establishment, saw the Clintons, saw the Bushes, he saw the media establishment, and he wanted to rebuke that, and he did. And, but now we need him gone, because he, he, he is too toxic, and that's another reason I would provide him. He's too toxic. He makes every debate just about him and about hating the other side. Uh, also, uh, just because you're, you don't believe the election was stolen doesn't mean you are ignoring half the country. More Republicans voted for Trump than any, or more people voted for Trump than any other Republican candidate. That that's impressive. His support among the Republicans at the time of the election was 90%, which is even good for an incumbent. But now it's about 40%. So his support among Republicans is half since the election because of his bogusness. Um, all right, and then now to my conclusion. Um, so we've mentioned this up here. Um, there are these two sides, progressive Democrats and the Trump Republicans, and both of them are responding to globalization and to failed foreign wars. And those are two uh, issues that I can sympathize with. There are a lot of, there's a lot of manufacturing jobs that have been sent overseas, a lot of populations that have been overlooked. And the progressives and the Trump Republicans are both trying to tap into this population. And I think it's important to address them. And you see this uh, Democrat party, which was a majority of minorities in 2012, and you see it becoming a lot wider, a lot more urban, a lot more educated. 
And now the most likely demographic to be a swing voter is a non-college educated, non-white voter. So that's why I have some hope in the parties. In their current state, I don't like it. But I believe that they both have to adjust to the fact that Republicans are becoming more diverse and Democrats are becoming less diverse. And the parties will have to adjust to try to get back that center, central voter. Thanks. Uh, before we give uh, the much needed round of applause, I just want to get an announcement. Join us now, which is after this, for the drinks receptions at, at 55 Broadway, which is above St. James Park Underground Station. So I hope to see you all there. Let's give our panel a huge round of applause.